Well, this is uh, Jim Hendershot again, uh, presenting Lecture 35, which we're coming to the end of this series now. And we're going to uh, discuss some uh, mechanical design issues for electric machines. Now, these are not your usual uh, topics that cover the obvious uh, issues with respect to design of how to design end bells and frames and all that stuff. Uh, I wanted to cover some, uh, give you some additional information, some things you might not be aware of, give you some uh, that are kind of unique to these high performance machines. So let's uh, see what we can find here. First of all, here's some uh, few cutaways to, uh, to set in your mind what we're talking about here. Uh, uh, you've seen some other cutaways, but there's here's a nice uh, illustration here of the basic callouts of a machine. They're basically all the same. These are NEMA IEC type frames, but even your special motors are going to have essentially these same components. Uh, this is a junction box back here. This particular one has a junction box on top, and this one doesn't have any junction box. It's got the lead wires uh, that are connected to phase winding. See, here's the lead wires and they're snaked out through a passageway in the housing to get out to this hole here where you bolt on a, a junction box. And uh, these have terminal lugs on them to make the connections to the wires coming from the inverter. These, these uh, details of, uh, of the lead egress and junction boxes and things are very important. They take up a lot of space in the end turns and, and uh, Thermally, they're not very good. That's why these, if there's lead wires like this, they're always a heavier gauge than what the magnet wire is because whatever current density you have in the magnet wire, you want it to be lower in the lead wires because these lead wires are not touching any metallic thing that can sink some heat out of it. And sure, they get a little cooling. If there's a fan cooling, they get a little cooling, but, but not all that much. Now, it's because they're so well insulated with this lousy thermally conductive... Uh, electrical insulation material on the outside. This particular motor has some ventilation in to suck some air in it. it. It also has this fan on the back and it looks like that particular fan is on the inside of the motor, not the outside. This one here, it, the fan's on the outside oh, oh, past the end bell with this stamp shield here and it sucks air in the center as we saw on another slide and blows it down over the the OD. Here's your rotor, your ball bearings, and uh, 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 I, I mentioned this before, but you notice this ball bearing is clamped here. The the uh, pay attention to the outer races here, because this is probably the only drawing I have of this. Uh, when when you have a motor here that uh, has a pulley on it or gears on it to go into a transmission, there's big side loadings on this shaft here, and these shafts will fatigue, they'll actually get overstressed, and sometimes they, they, they break right at the, uh, right at the keyway there, and, uh, but, but the side loads will cause the outer race of this bearing to skid and rotate at a very low speed, and it'll gall up the bearing bore, if this is aluminum, wear that out, this one here is probably cast iron, but there's no way of knowing for sure, whether it is or not, but so if it's an aluminum uh, bearing bore there, uh, frequently it's not uncommon to put a clamp here to clamp the race between there so it can't skid. Now the back bearing has to float and there has to be preload springs in this. The back bearing has to float because as this motor heats up, the, the, the shaft probably heats, gets the hottest and is going to expand. Whereas the, the stator's got a lot of surface mass, so even uh, the, the frame has got a lot of surface mass and, and it's fan cooled. So uh, even with the intense heat that's uh, generated inside the windings, that's not going to cause this stator housing to expand near as fast as the rotor will. So that means that with the bearing shoulders on the inside of the bearings, that the shaft's going to push that bearing that way. And so you can't restrain it there. You want it restrained here. So this uh, uh, clamp, uh, this bearing keeps it, uh, actually keeps uh, it from moving, but the, the back bearing has to have a preload to keep the preload on the, on the internal clearance in the bearings and, and must be allowed to shift. Sometimes you get vibration here. It's not uncommon. It's a little trick to put an O-ring groove there and put an O-ring in there to act as a, it'll roll with the expansion contraction, but that'll dampen any vibrations back there. So these are some little tricks that are important in the mechanical design. Uh, this is an exploded view uh, of a of a 10-pole brushless motor that we use on our dynamometer kits that uh, 
that uh, the University of Minnesota uses. And you can see the rotor core here and there, the magnets are glued on there. There's a retainment uh, sleeve that goes around the magnets to keep them from flying off. Here's a shaft, there's a stator with the end windings and the slots in the stator, etc. And this is an aluminum housing and, and that's heated up and this is shrunk in there. Uh, but to have good thermal conductivity with the OD of the uh, lamination inside this aluminum housing, what we do there to improve the thermal conductivity, we coat this with the thermal grease of the thermal paste that you put under the, uh, a transistor when you clamp it down to a heat sink. When you mount it on, on a board, you, you use that, uh, that tube of silicon paste which is good thermal conductivity. Well, we coat the whole OD of this, heat this up, drop it in there, and so it fills up any voids or gaps in between the uh, laminations and gives better thermal conductivity. That's another good trick. Now, another way to, you saw in that slide that the, the stator housing, the stator went into a housing. This is an example of, uh, of an extruded housing that's made out of extruded aluminum. It's got a round hole in it and the stator will be heat shrunk inside of that as well. But this is another way to make stators. Probably one of the most popular way now is to uh, see when you make a, if you make a round, if, if I stamp a round lamination out of a square piece of steel, I throw the corners away. I thought it's the cost of the material of those corners I throw away is included in the price of the lamp. So why throw them away? Now why not keep them and make the lamp square? Okay, you get rid of a little bit of it, but make the lamp square and, and lay, let the, the laminations uh, be bigger. You, you, you can make the rotor bigger and uh, move the rotor out by the space you save for that frame. And so we've got the, to, to keep the same square dimension of the of the motor to meet uh, a dimensional NEMA standard, I can make the lamination bigger, the rotor bigger, get more torque, and, and the thermal situation is not bad here. Sometimes they'll even uh, punch this uh, with fins in it. Here's another version of a, uh, of a, uh, a octagon shaped. This is a Fanuc, Fanuc motor with the, uh, uh, with the octagon shaped encoder cover on the back, a resolver cover. And uh, th this is the IPM using ceramic mags and use exposed lambs like that clamp between two end bells. So those are both good ways to manufacture a machine. And uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, uh, important issues to think about for uh, mechanical design is electromagnetic vibrations, rotor balance bearing systems, motor mounting connections, uh, connections meaning lead wires and, and terminals, and windage and cooling fans. The sources of mechanical excitation that causes uh, airborne noise and structural noise are uh, rotor dynamic eccentricity, uh, stator bore eccentricities or elliptical stator bores, mounting and coupling misalignment, air flow over or through the machine, in case of induction motor, broken rotor bars cause noise. And then there's mechanical reasons why you have uh, noise. Uh, or, or Those were the mechanical. There's electromagnetic reason why you have noise. Magnetostriction in the steel laminations themselves, sometimes uh, thought to be uh, they, what they call transformer hum. It's thought that the AC uh, causes them to vibrate, but it's, it, it does in a way, but not exactly. Magnetostriction means that the, the all dimensions of the, the steel expand and contract as a function of the magnetic uh, flux that's uh, flowing through it. Isn't that amazing? Did you know that when you magnetize a piece of steel, it expands, and when you demagnetize it, it contracts? Uh, and uh, a, a, there's a textbook uh, by, by an author named Honda. has nothing to do with the Honda cars, but it's a Japanese uh, engineer that wrote this textbook. And he has a big section in a whole chapter on magnetostriction and results of all the test data of different kinds of lamination materials and what magnetostriction properties they exhibit. Now, uh, there are magnetostrictive materials that are made that way on purpose to use as sensors and uh, those are good, but in, uh, we don't like to have magnetostriction characteristic in electrical steels and motors because it causes them to be noisy. You'll, you'll hear the hum as a function of commutation frequency and it's proportional to RPM because the, the number of times of commutation uh, 
uh, per revolution. It's, it's, uh, it's not bad with sinusoidal driven motors because phases aren't instantly turned on and off, so they're not instantly magnetized and demagnetized like they are with a six step, but uh, it's a problem with stick, six step driven motors. Then there's the uh, harmonics you get from windings and, and from saturation, from slotting. Again, broken bars, that's an electromagnetic problem too, as well as mechanical. And then the PWM voltage chopping sometimes causes no noise from torque pulsations. And there's radial forces uh, that uh, exhibit waves for rotor deformation. We're going to look at some of those. The uh, motor, housing, frame, and end belts. Let's talk about that. The, sta the stator air gap diameter after fitting into the housing needs to be as concentric to the end frame pilot diameters as possible. End frame pilot diameters meaning the diameters that pilot the, uh, the uh, bearing carriers uh, to the stator of the motor because you want the shaft to run concentric to the ID of the stator core. That means that the, the uh, bearing bores have to run concentric with the pilot diameter on the end bell and the pilot diameter has to run concentric with the ID of the core. Uh, so uh, th so that's uh, what these next couple thing about concentricity is important. Rotor OD should be concentric to the shaft diameters or the shaft journals uh, as economically possible. Uh, sometimes it's uh, like in step motors, it, that's so critical. You have to grind the rotor from the journal bearings. Uh, high speed motors, I think you have to do that. But uh, normal induction motors and uh, it probably you probably need to machine the OD of the rotor, even a squirrel cage, a small squirrel cage motors with small gaps. Uh, the rotor should be always balanced per the per specification. Balance levels consistent with the rated speed. Uh, uh, and the, the the purpose of all the above points is to avoid eccentrics air gap to reduce noise and vibration and to make sure you have balanced radial loads on, on the magnetic loads. If the air gap is tapered, you're going to have greater force on one side than the other. And you always want to avoid broken bars in AC induction rotor. Bearing designs are important. These are mechanical problems. A lot of uh, uh, electrical engineers that design motors uh, leave this uh, these details to some mechanical engineer, but in small companies you can't do that. You have to do it all. So uh, there's two kinds of bearings. Well, I guess there's three kinds of bearing. More than there's probably more than three. Even you can use anti-friction bearings are the most common. These are ball bearings or roller bearings, and uh, other choices are sleeve bearings. But they don't. They're they they're used for DC permanent magnet motors, but they're not used for and and some uh, single phase induction motors and appliances use sleeve bearings, but not on any of the brushless motors that are the the uh, motors that we've been talking about in this uh, in this series of lectures, these all have to have friction bearings. Real high speed ones could use uh, magnetic bearings or foil air bearings. Those are uh, acceptable and work very well. Uh, bearings, uh, anti-friction bearings must be preloaded. As we talked about in the last slide, uh, the shaft expands at a different rate than the, than the frame. So, so uh, one of the races has to be loose enough to move. There's bearing standard fits called American Bearing Manufacturer Associated Standard. I don't know what ABEX stands for, but those are our standard dimensions for classes of bearings and their tolerances and, and recommended tight fits and, and loose fits. Bearings are always pressed in a rotating member. Never let a inner race be loose on a, on a rotating rotor in a motor. The inner race always has to be pressed. Uh, and then uh, one air, one bearing at the at the upper shaft end should be actually clamped, as I said before. And the other bearing's got to float with a uh, preload spring in it. Now I, I promised that we would look at some uh, 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 radial deflection modes of the stator caused by the, the electromagnetic forces on the stator that that uh, causes a lot of noise in a machine. These are uh, most annoying with reluctance machines, particularly a switch reluctance that has salient poles on both the rotor. There's a terrific attracting force between the radial, uh, uh, the salient poles as the rotor rotates, uh, 
and uh, and then when the phase is de-energized, it's de-energized very rapidly. So the uh, the uh, stator has deflected. If you have a lot of poles in the machine, the whole th the the stator yokes in compression, and it just squeezes everything in by a uniform amount. That's the uh, the least uh, noisy. A, uh, there's not too many nodes that are tri modes that are triangular. They're either two pole because you have to have pole pairs. If you had a pair of poles here and a pair of poles here and a pair of poles here, you could get this condition. But uh, but normally, if you have a two pole machine, uh, you see the uh, the circle of the uh, a stator yoke is trying to elliptify itself. In the case of a four pole machine, it's trying to square a circle. And here's another case of squaring a circle. And this is one, two, three, four, five. This is uh, five uh, pole pairs, uh, but they'd have to be close together. You can have six or eight modes. And uh, the, uh, the this is going to vibrate at the natural frequency of the, the deflection is determined by the natural frequency and the stiffness of the of the stator. And as you could see, uh, four pole machines should be quieter than a two pole because in this case you have this whole uh, half of the rotor that's in a bending moment to collapse and cause this displacement which when released will uh, uh, do a lot of air disturbance and cause noise but in the same diameter if you have a four pole and trying to make this square the the uh, length of the of the piece of the stator that's bending is only a quarter uh, half as long as it is here. It's, uh, they're 90 degrees, so that turns out, if you measure it, it turns out to be quieter. Here's, uh, uh, you can calculate these vibration modes with this formula here. And uh, uh, you can do finite element analysis and model all this stuff, but that's a real problem. And any loose components have to be avoided, particularly in the stator winding, because if they're not restrained, and they're going to vibrate from the magnetic forces on them, and if they vibrate, and rub against each other, eventually they're going to wear through the insulation. You're going to get turn to turn shorts or shorts to ground or shorts to the frame or whatever. So, uh, so the end turns are normally laced and big machines, they're, they're me mechanically supported. I showed you some of those in the earlier uh, uh, series. And, and you certainly vacuum, impregnate, and varnish and VIP the, uh, the entire stator core to stabilize all the windings to keep them from vibrating. Uh, now, big, large machines with open slots, they'll re they, sometimes they put steel magnetic slot wedges in with the insulating wedge behind it. PM motor magnets, as we've said many times before, often require retention of sleeves or wrapping of yarns, pretension yarn around them, so that nothing is loose. Uh, Induction motor rotor bars have to be restrained from vibration. They have to be brazed in there. They have to be swaged in there, or uh, the use of uh, of uh, of uh, adhesives. Some large machines, great big machines, they actually shim the bars in place. They drive wedges between at each end between the uh, the uh, bars and uh, and the. Uh, when you you could build a stator, you could build a rotor. Not a, well, you could you could build a rotor uh, a, a rotor in particular because it's very important that there's no motion or vibration in a rotor because of balance and so on. So you could build this the rotor in sections of laminations with those vent uh, spaces between them, and you you set the conductors the bars up first that you're going to brace to the end rings. You set those up first and put each pack of uh, lambs over top of that and you drive little wedges down the side of the bars to wedge them in that pack of lambs then put the vent spacer on and then the next uh, set of lambs and then uh, wedge those in do that for the whole length that's done as well for large machines uh, and uh, IPM rotor cores are, are frequently skewed one stator slot uh, bearings must be actually preloaded we've covered that uh, Bearing races press fit. Output bearings should have router race restrained. We've said that before. And here's the best bearing choices are anti friction, magnetic, hydrostatic, or foil. We said that before too. Now here's a uh, uh, a uh, cross section of a of a nice motor here, and we want to talk about a serious problem 
that can cause early antifritzin bearing failure, and that is that you can get discharged currents circulating through the bearings from race to ball, uh, through the shaft and back through the other bearing due to PWM uh, motor drives. And this is a big problem that causes a bearing, it's supposed to be a B there, causes bearing barrier. Uh, here's a picture of a race of a bearing. It causes this, uh, this, uh, uh, this fretting here. And you can see that that's going to be a very noisy bearing and it's going to cause a failure of that bearing. And uh, SKF has developed an insulated ball bearing. And uh, uh, there's, uh, there's another company here, August SGR. These are grounding rings that go right on the shaft and they ground the shaft to the, to the uh, frame so that you have a uh, lower resistance path. They'll put that grounding ring maybe right here or or out here so that'll short the frame to the to the shaft so that it won't uh, want to go through the bearing because uh, the resistance is lower so that's a serious problem the uh, stator core into the frame uh, is frequently shrink fitted in cast iron steel or aluminum large shrink fits result in a lot of radial compression stresses on the stator core and this will increase the iron losses there's a lot of discussion and work and testing about that. One motor this happens, the next motor it does. It doesn't seem like uh, aluminum frames uh, can uh, are, uh, offer enough uh, compressive forces to cause this problem, but certainly cast iron frames do. So uh, how do you get rid of that? You use very light interference fit and uh, keep it from rotating with anti-rotation pins right in the air gap or set screws into the stator core from the OD. Uh, another another uh, way is to use open frame motors that I showed you in the second slide, uh, <clears throat> with uh, and, and then uh, the use of Loctite in the sh in the out, out on smaller machines. You can use Loctite on the outside of the rotor, and larger machines will use keys, uh, six, eight, ten, twelve keys that are uh, are uh, in the. Uh, or outer stator core and uh, the, then the welded frame has these machine keyways in it and and it's all fitted uh, in, in these uh, in these keys are fitted in the keyways it's it looks to me like it's hard to get the alignment right to get all that to go together but I've watched them assemble those and they we can really do it now uh, there's uh, there's a th acoustical of aspects of noise uh, of motors uh, they're caused by the electromagnetic and the mechanical vibration uh, uh, sources that we discussed in an earlier slide there, there's three principal causes of this is the magnetic and the mechanical and the one we didn't uh, talk about is windage windage can cause noise motor audible noise scales of comparison and measurement sound power and sound pressure study about that elsewhere the difference between sound power and sound pressure the DBA scale is said to be the best uh, scale used to uh, equal the human air response to noise and vibration. Sound waves and noise energy generated from windage and magnetics are excited and amplified by the mechanical structure, in not just the, the structure of the motor, but it, including the frame that the motor is mounted on. So it's not uncommon to use uh, uh, energy absorbing shock absorber mounts or rubber mounts, things like that to quiet things up. Magnetic uh, and mechanical uh, uh, sources are structural noise. Windage is uh, windage noise said to be airborne, even though all noise becomes airborne eventually to reach the human ear. Uh, the uh, sound propagation of the windage can be reduced by increasing the size of the air, the cooling inlets and outlets, and you could perforate the air, uh, the surfaces of the air inlets and outlets where the air uh, passes over. If you perforate that, it has an effect of uh, dampening the, the noise. It sucks some of the energy down in the perforations and it's like blowing a whistle over, uh, you have a tube and you're blowing across the tube and you're, you're, you're getting a column of air to vibrate in the tube and that the vibrating air from the, over the perforation seems to do some canceling of the noise propagated from the air going over it. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but the experts that design those, namely uh, turbine people, 
uh, if you look at jet engines on your airplane on your next flight, you'll see the perforated uh, inlet scowls, uh, cowls there that, that cuts down some of the noise from the engines for the people that live in the ground around the airport. Uh, uh, use only, let's see, use, uh, now heat exchangers can be noisy too. So try to, to enclose air to air or air to liquid heat exchangers so that uh, they don't uh, uh, put them in enclosures so they don't uh, cause uh, so much noise. Uh, the, the, this type of work and analysis is based on experience and trial and error. You can do a lot of FEA analysis of different designs using a computational fluid dynamics simulation software but this is all 3D stuff and it takes a real long time to solve and, and it's very expensive analysis. They use this for jet engines and critical things. I'm not sure you're going to use uh, computational fluid dynamics simulations for, for a simple motor to, to, to analyze the windage and the noise propagation, but, but it's, it's available and you could do it. Now the magnetic no noise sources in electric machines are are uh, caused by uh, uh, non-uniform air gap flux because of superimposed harmonic fields that result. There's uh, uh, air gap uh, magnetic force waves cause radial forces on the stator core and tangential forces on the stator teeth and, they, and, and, and uh, that causes the teeth to vibrate as well. Uh, putting um, steel uh, wedges in the teeth, that helps as well. I, I know of one case where uh, some sound engineers at, uh, at Purdue, they told me about they had the vibrating teeth in a big generator and they damped them by putting steel wedges in the slots, in the slot openings at the, at the ID of the stator. And, but they used two pieces of steel and bonded them together, uh, two pieces of steel and bonded them together in rubber so that as the, if, as the uh, teeth bent, they were dampened by this action with this rubber in between. It was very effective in eliminating the noise problem. And uh, here's the formula for the natural frequency of the teeth. And uh, the second formula there is to calculate the natural frequency of the stator core. Uh, uh, we saw before the, uh, the nodes and so on uh, in that other diagram from MIT that I showed you based on a number of poles. Well, here's a, uh, uh, this is, uh, this is a type of plot you'd get from a finite element uh, analysis of the, uh, of the nodes caused by the magnetic radial forces. Uh, so how do you reduce the noise in electric machines? Well, we talked about insert, insert a magnetic wedges in the slot opening and you make them laminated so there's some dampening in it with some rubber in between two pieces we talked about that add a slight taper to the tape the the teeth if you have room to take away from your windings in other words uh you're 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 making the section modulus stiffer by making the teeth wider where it connects to the stator a little taper there helps increase the core length to if you if you can do that that's expensive and all that but what that does is that reduces the, mag the radial magnetic forces because you're spreading the forces that you need to produce the torque, the radial vector of the, of the tangential forces, you're spreading that out over a, a, a bigger piece of mass so the, so the forces are lower per unit length. Uh, adjust the stator stop, slot depth and the stator yoke. In other words, if you can, if you have the winding room, make the slots more shallow and the yoke thicker. This will give you a bigger section modulus to re resist that deflection. Uh, if, if, uh, if you have rotor bar combinations that are causing noise, it's hard to identify that and analyze that, but if that's the case, uh, you can change the number of slots in the rotor state. It requires a new lamp. It's important to pick the right number to begin with and use the guidelines there, and then that won't be a problem. Uh, there's, uh, here's a little bibliography for you for uh, uh, some very good papers on, uh, on uh, auto motor audible noise resources. Uh, you can look all these up. These are f uh, taken from proceedings uh, on, a, on a sound uh, meeting by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers in Dearborn in 2008. 
Uh, and so thank you very much. That concludes this lecture.